we allow our world and our values and how we judge each other and how we judge others and what we feel guilty about or not guilty about to be decided not by what we think is right, but be decided often by what people sometimes thousands of years ago believed was right. Because we don't, A, ask the question why, which is the most liberating question it's possible to ask, and B, have the courage and confidence to stand up and say, well, I don't think we should be doing this. I don't care how long we've done it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to do it another way. Um, last time I was in Liverpool, I told the story, but for those, those who weren't there that night, it's worth repeating of um, the lady in the audience when I spoke in Houston in Texas who came up to me afterwards when I'd been talking about all this and she said, um, you know, I've got a story, she said, that sums up what you're saying. She said, when I was, um, when I was first married, she said, I used to cut the corners off the ham before I put it in the pan and put it in the oven, you know. She said, and one day my husband came up to me and said, why do you do that? She said, I don't know, my mother used to do it. What's it matter? You know. So he said, well, why did your mother cut the corners off the ham before she put it in a pan? She said, I don't know, my mother, she just did it. What's it matter? He said, call your mother and ask her why she cut the corners off the ham. So she calls her mother and... Uh, she said, Mom, you know, you know when I was a girl and you used to cut the corners off the ham, and why did you do that? Her mother said, because my pan was never big enough. And if you kind of uh, look at the world in general from the perspective of that simple tale, you can see that so much that we accept as conventional wisdom is merely existing for the want of the word why and the courage to say, well, I'm going to do it another way. If we don't start to do that, then we are the mouse in the tube, thinking we are free while going on doing as we're told. And that will have great consequences for our children, to say the least. Before I come into the nature of this global effort to control the world, I just want to talk briefly about uh, where I'm coming from and what I term the knowledge that is being kept from us. Because there's loads of myths about me, crikey. I mean, there's a, I'm a myth maker extraordinaire. Well, people make them for me. Apparently, I think I'm the Messiah. Well, I wish I was, because it wouldn't have saved me ferry fares when I come from the Isle of Wight, you know. Could walk across the Solent. I've apparently discovered religion. Which is really strange that I've written six books challenging the imposition of dogmatic religion and describing it as one of the greatest forms of mind control known to the human race. What I'm actually suggesting, and it's no more than what I believe and what increasing numbers of people believe, increasingly open-minded scientists too, challenges both the conventional views of who we are and what we're doing here. We're kind of offered the uh, choice of believing that there is some judgmental God saying, you have sinned and you shall be punished. And that after one life on this planet, this guy judges whether we go to heaven or hell forever. The other alternative is that uh, offered by conventional, this world is all there is science, which says that we are basically a cosmic accident of evolution and we have no past, no future, and basically, as I saw on a t-shirt once, life's a bitch and then you die. Doesn't really seem like much of a choice to me. There is an alternative to both, which is increasingly emerging as the suppression is overcome, cast aside. And I'll just briefly sum up what that alternative is. It's that everything in creation is the same energy in different states of being. 
just as water, clouds and ice are the same substance in different states of being, so everything that exists is the same energy in different states of being. And energy is also consciousness. Some more enlightened, open-minded scientists are now suggesting, and have been for some time, for instance, that it can be shown that water has a memory. Well, water as a memory seems to be cracky. That's crazy. It's water. How can it, how can it have a memory? But it can have a memory if energy is consciousness. Because therefore, everything has some kind of memory, some kind of retention of experience, whether it be a, a wall, water, the sky, ourselves, whatever. So if that is the case, then what we're looking at in this infinite creation is one gigantic mind. And it's this mind, this one consciousness that is everything expressing itself through different forms that is the force that has become known as God or whatever name you'd like to call it. Some people call it the infinite mind. It matters not. This God is not some guy with a beard sitting on a throne handing out punishments for people who don't do as he says. And it's always a he. Have you noticed that? It is the consciousness that is everything. And the way I see it, and increasing numbers of people see it, and indeed have done throughout human history, is that we are aspects of that whole. We, are, if you like, are like droplets of water in this ocean of consciousness. We're individual to a certain extent, but all together we make up the whole. The question that comes back from that is, if we are eternal beings on the level of the mind, the consciousness, the thinking, feeling, us, then where do we go when this life is over? If it's not, as science suggests, one life and then lights out. It kind of uh, has become accepted that when you're talking about life after death, you look up, don't you? I think, you know, heaven's at 30,000 feet or something. But in fact, uh, creation's not kind of made up of chest of drawers, levels like that. This one gigantic mind we call creation, God or whatever name you'd like to choose, is broken up into frequencies, wavelets, sharing the same space. Just as uh, all the radio stations broadcasting to Liverpool here tonight are sharing the same space that we are all occupying, and they're all sharing the same space that they are occupying, even though we can't see them and they can't see each other, that is the uh, very uh, close and indeed the very same principle on which creation is broken up into wavelengths of, of life, wavelengths of consciousness, in other words. So when we see things like the great mystery of ghosts, this uh, misty figure that we people see from time to time, from that perspective, it's no longer a great mystery, it is an entity, a consciousness on another wavelength. Just as um, if you get a radio and you tune it not quite on the station, but uh, just off the station, you get principally the station you're closest to, but you're getting some interference from other stations. So in consciousness terms, visual terms, we are, when we see a ghost, tuning to a certain extent to another frequency, another wavelength, and we're seeing something of it. And the reason that it's not solid in the way it uh, appears to us is because we're not actually right on the dial of that particular wavelength. We're only picking up uh, the very outside of it. So the consciousness, the thinking, feeling, eternal us, is, if you like, very similar to that radio dial. At any point in our evolution, we are tuned to one of creation's infinite number of wavelengths. At the moment, everyone on earth is tuned to this, what you might call, physical wavelength, physical vibration. Therefore, this is our reality. You know, we look around us and this frequency, this physical frequency, is what we see. But psychic people can see something of other frequencies, indeed we're all psychic if we only realized it. 
And so, again, from this emerging perspective, this other great mystery called near-death experiences is no longer a mystery. Because what's happening in these millions and millions of uh, similar stories that have emerged uh, throughout the world over the past years or so, where people say, I, I, when, when, when they died in our clinical terms, they were looking down on their physical body, and they say, it was my mind, it was my emotions, it was me looking down, but I wasn't part of my physical body anymore. And people say, oh, it's a great mystery, that. All that's happening is the eternal part of us, the consciousness, the thinking, feeling, us, is withdrawing from the physical form. And that's all that happens on what we call death. And I was kind of interested um, a few months ago to uh, turn on the news and see uh, a story about near-death experiences. And what the news item was saying was that because resuscitation equipment in the uh, crash areas of hospitals had improved so much in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, more people were being revived from clinical death and therefore more people were telling these near-death experience stories. So this had kind of intrigued the people involved so much that they'd, they'd uh, launched this scientific study to see if they could find out more about what was going on. And one of the things that the, uh, the news item said they were doing was to put symbols, funny symbols, on the top of the light shades in the crash areas. You get the idea, only seen from above, yeah? And it kind of occurred to me that we'll get uh, final confirmation that consciousness can exist outside the physical body when someone comes back to life and says, hey, up, Doc, you want to see the funny symbol on the top of your light shade? But what kind of uh, intrigued me most about this item was that the scientist at the end said, you know, we could be on the verge of the astonishing discovery that consciousness can exist outside the physical body. And that's astonishing because people have been saying that for thousands and thousands of years. This is not new knowledge we're talking about here. This is re-emerging knowledge, re-emerging understanding after a vast period of suppression. Suppression that is part of control. If you want to control somebody and you want to get them to do what you want them to do, then if you can keep from their understanding the knowledge of who they are and what they're doing here and their inf infinite potential for love, for creativity, for contribution, that this is merely a short period of experience in our eternal evolution through experience, then you can very much easier, e more easily control people. If they have the choice of a judgmental God who will judge us on one life on earth, and of course, we know what God wants you to do, then you can get people to do what you want them to do. And also, if you can get them to feel this sense of worthlessness, of being nothing more than an accident with no worth and no past and no future, then again, you can suppress the spirit and the true potential. So keeping from us who we are and the nature of life has been fundamental, and it's only now that it's beginning to re-emerge. And even conventional, although it's very, very uh, little time since it began to emerge, conventional science is being pressed now to address these explanations because the evidence that's coming to light more and more is making that impossible to ignore. I turned on the television again uh, to hear the end of a series of lectures from the Royal Society uh, a few months ago. And the scientist at the end was projecting forward where science was being led by evidence that was now coming to light. And he said, we seem to be being pushed into the area that suggests that all is the same energy, something else that has been said for thousands of years. 
But because these explanations have been unable to find a place in the mainstream media, billions continue to fear death, to be frightened of some eternal damnation when all that happens is that we reborn onto another frequency. It has kept from us also the knowledge that over eons of time, our evolving consciousness has reincarnated on its journey into endless physical bodies. Black, white, red, yellow, rich, poor, Protestant, Catholic. And what a nonsense this makes of what we do to each other. The prejudice of racism, sexism and all the rest. What those who consider themselves racially and sexually superior are really saying is I've got a genetic spacesuit, a body, which was made in a different place and is a different color or design to yours, therefore I'm superior. And yet because this understanding has been lost, suppressed in the mainstream, we have conflict around the world that is based on the belief that this physical body, this finite vehicle for the consciousness to experience, is us. So you get people of a certain ancestral line of the physical body looking down their ancestral line, their genetic line, and seeing what another genetic line did to their genetic line maybe hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago. And because this is considered to be us, many people feel that they have to, in this life, get revenge on that genetic line because of what it did to them thousands of years ago, or hundreds of years ago, or whenever. And so you have these ongoing ethnic uh, conflicts that go from generation to generation as one generation of dogma hands it on to the next one. And the great irony, of course, is that the reincarnation of the consciousness could quite easily create a situation where the consciousness in that genetic line that did something to this genetic line is now the same consciousness here. I mean, maybe I am going crackers, but every time I, every time I see Ian Paisley, something in my head says he was a pope. <laughs> From this wider perspective, so much of what we do to each other must have the rest of creation shaking their heads in disbelief. The fact is that someone born in the United States is not more special than someone born in Mexico. Someone born in London is not more special than someone born in Liverpool. Someone who is uh, white is not more special than someone who is black. They're just vehicles for the consciousness to experience. If you go down to the seashore and you pick up a droplet of water in your hand, how can anyone say that that droplet is any more or less special than all the other billions and trillions of droplets you see in the ocean before you? So when I began to understand all this, and appreciate this other explanation to dogmatic religion and this world is all there is science. I started to ask a, a few questions of uh, this situation. Like how come that this explanation at the very bottom line least is as credible as the other two? How come the other two get guaranteed airtime? Often no questions asked. Here's your airtime. Say what you like. And the alternative to both of them is ridiculed, condemned, or suppressed by reflex action. The answer that I came up with was that clearly some people don't want the public to have access to this information. But who and what and why? And I began to ask other questions. Like, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people in my life and I can't, to my knowledge, recall anyone who wanted a war. 
who had any interest in wars, who felt that wars were anything but horrific and to be avoided. So I thought, how come the world's been awash with wars throughout the century? Who's behind them? Or what? Or why? Then I kind of looked at this economic system that controls the world. An economic system that is so sane that the more successful it is in its own terms, the quicker it destroys the planet. It's the perfect environmental and human assassin. It insists every year that we take more from the earth even quicker, turn it into even more things, sell even more things, consume even more things, throw away even more things to worship the real God of the modern world, economic growth. It insists that every year 20% of the people of the world consume 80% of the resources while leaving the other 80% to get by on the other 20%. Crazy. Of course it is. But that's the economic system, take, make and throw away, that controls your life and mine. And that of six billion people nearly. So I thought, what's behind this self-destruction? Or who and why? I started to look at some of the other uh, conventional wisdom that we pass on from generation to generation as the only way of doing things in this world. The wisdom that says, even though the economic system that I've just described is dismantling this planet, you ask a politician of any party anywhere in the world, what do we do to get out of this environmental situation? And they will say, we must have more uh, growth to raise the money to spend on the environment. If I said to you the way to put out a fire is to pour more petrol on it, you'd say he's out of his mind. But that's what the politicians are saying when they say about more growth to sort out the environment. It's conventional wisdom that it's fine to treat animals as mere commodities. To be made as fat as possible, as quick as possible, on as little food as possible. To condemn every year billions of animals to a lifetime of pain, fear and suffering in the name of economics. You're sane if you judge your success in healthcare, not by how many people are healthy, but by how many diseased people you manage to treat. We're treating more patients than ever before. Why? Why are so many people ill? It's conventional wisdom that rising house prices are a sign of economic success when thousands are homeless because they can't afford them. You're sane, finally, if you think it's fine to support a system that is so successful that every year it turns out more suicide, alcoholism, drug taking, homelessness, pain, stress, fear and suffering in all its forms. We'd be in real trouble if this system wasn't working, wouldn't we? That is sanity, apparently. But it's the ultimate insanity. So who's behind it? Or what and why? I began to realize, too, that against the background of this utter self-destruction, on this same planet is stunning wisdom. And I began to see also that there is a great difference between cleverness and wisdom. They're not the same thing. This system is very clever, but it isn't very wise. And it's the lack of wisdom that is the problem. And I began to see that what we call wisdom is often not found in this state-of-the-art letters-after-their-name system. It's actually found in the native peoples that this system would see as backward piece of Native American wisdom, what have become known as American Indians, when you have cut down the last tree and poisoned the last river, you will know that you cannot eat money. That's wisdom. And there's another piece of very 
famous American Indian wisdom. In 1854, a, uh, the American government made an offer for Indian land. And under the system that I've been talking about and the attitudes and the values that are indoctrinated into us, what should have happened is this chief should have said, right, well, I'm, I'm on a winner here because it's a seller's market. I never put it on the market, therefore I'm in the driving seat. So what I'll do is duck and weave and I'll crack on. I don't want to sell. Get them to push up the price. And at the moment that I think they're going to pull out, I'll put out my hand and say, and say you've convinced me. And people will think, oh, what a great businessman he is. That chief. Fantastic. If he's something in the city, he will. But there's another value system on this planet also. A value system that said this in terms of this chief. How can you buy or sell the sky? We do not own the freshness of the air or the sparkle on the water. How then can you buy them from us? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people, holy in their memory and experience. We know the white man does not understand our ways. He's a stranger who comes in the night and takes from the land whatever he needs. The earth is not his friend, but his enemy. And when he's conquered it, he moves on. He kidnaps the earth from his children. His appetite will devour the earth and leave behind a desert. If the beasts were gone, we would die from a great loneliness of the spirit. For whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. It's sobering to think that those words were spoken in 1854 when you look what has happened since. So I began to think about all this and I also remember that two or three times in my life different people have said to me, you know, um, you know behind all this economics and politics stuff, you know a very few people actually control the world. And that kind of takes you aback when you first hear it, because you think there's six billion people in this world. How can that be? But I started to look into what was behind this madness. And like so many things in my life over the last four years, a certain sequence unfolded. Once I had come to the conclusion that there was something in this, that thought pattern, if you like. Suddenly, from all angles, this information about what the hell's going on is hitting me all over the place. I spoke in Hull, and a guy came out of the audience at the end with, I'll never forget it, three blue plastic bags full of papers. And he said, I think you ought to read this. Thank you very much. And I got it home, and I read it, and it was unpublished material. It was photocopied parts of books and what have you. And I began to understand the nature of the conspiracy that's been going on. And since that point, so much information has come my way from so many different sources. And I've been staggered to realize just how many people outside the public arena have been investigating this for a long time. And what I found most compelling is that some of them come from my direction, the way I see creation. Some come from Christianity. Some come from nowhere. Some have come into it by saying what's wrong with the economic system and who controls it. Some have come in from science by being involved in science and knowing that there is a lot of scientific knowledge that they know about that isn't being made public. And everyone's kind of converged in this same area of common agreement of what is going on. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on this evening, that area of common agreement. The story of known human history is really the story of the use and abuse of this esoteric spiritual knowledge, whatever word you'd like to use. The knowledge of who we are, the nature of life, and more importantly, the knowledge of how to program a consciousness 
get it to think your way. And how to harness these energies of creation that are all around us for positive or negative reasons. Because knowledge is just that, knowledge. Knowledge is not positive or negative, it's neutral. It's how you use it that's negative or positive. I mean, you can have the knowledge of how to make an atomic bomb, but you don't have to build one and drop it on Japan. So this knowledge was passed on, this advanced knowledge, through the levels of initiation in the ancient mystery schools of Babylon and uh, Egypt and so on. And over a period of time, it entered the secret society network, the global secret society network that's emerged over a long, long period of time. And it's at this high level, this highest level of this level of initiation within these secret organizations that the knowledge of what's going on is held. Now, secrecy doesn't have to be sinister, just as esoteric knowledge is not sinister. It's just knowledge. Many times uh, during the savage reign of imposed Christianity and other imposed religions through the Dark Ages and what have you and beyond, passing on this knowledge secretly was absolutely vital to the uh, self-preservation of those doing it. So I can understand totally why this knowledge was passed on secretly uh, through these levels of initiation in in that period and also through symbolic legends, symbolic stories that passed on the knowledge without actually coming out with it openly, which would have been fatal. I can understand also why some of the advanced knowledge that knows how to manipulate energy fields and energies to create great destruction was passed on only to people it was considered could be trusted with it. I can understand all that. But it would appear that over a period of time towards in coming into the modern world that this network of secret societies and the advanced knowledge that it contains at its highest levels has been infiltrated and string pulled by a force that has used this network for very negative reasons. In short, to control the human race without the human race knowing it's being controlled. It's used this secrecy to manipulate and keep from the people the knowledge that we have every right to know. Within this knowledge, this esoteric knowledge and how these energies work, for instance, is the knowledge that exists today and has done for some time of how to uh, create technology that harnesses the Earth's natural energy field and turns it into usable warmth and power. The idea that we have to take fossil fuels from this planet and turn them into pollution to survive is utterly ludicrous. The alternative already exists. And it's really funny, you know, how many people who've come up with this alternative have actually ended up in prison. I know two for a start. One of them's still there. It holds the knowledge also of how to create technology, anti-gravity technology as it's called, that would make the space shuttle look like the technological equivalent of a London taxi. That knowledge is known in the world today. But knowledge is empowerment. And the last thing manipulators want for the human race is for them to be empowered. Empowered people do not succumb anything like as easy to control. The kind of long-term name going right back of this conspiracy is the great work of ages. It's used religion for its own ends. It's used science for its own ends. It uses any vehicle for its own ends. It does not have a party line. It does not have a basic religion. It just uses whatever vehicle is necessary to manipulate and control. It had another name 
that was very secret for a long time, but is now very public. The name is the New World Order. The very words spoken by George Bush after the blatantly engineered Gulf War of 1991 are now used constantly by politicians across the world to describe the future of global politics and economics. Today, the manipulation to bring about this new world order pervades every area of our lives. The people behind it may be strange, but they are far, far from stupid. They understand the system that I've been describing tonight because they created it. If you built a car from scratch, every nut and every washer, you would know everything there is to know about that car. They built the system. They know everything there is to know about the system and how to manipulate it. Indeed, it was created and structured to make manipulation easy. What the New World Order means is the creation of one world government to which all nation states would be subordinate, one world central bank, one world currency that wouldn't be physical money, it would be credit, one world army, and as I'll come to later, a microchipped population. Of course, the more you centralize power, obviously the fewer hands can control the whole. And if you look at the history, of particularly this century, you see that in all areas of our lives, whether it be local businesses or whatever, the power has gone away from the individual and the community, even the town and city, to the center. It's now moving on into the uh, continent with the European community, which is, uh, again, as I'll come to later, the final step before they go global. And you'd have seen also that when you challenge this centralization, this rationalization as it's called, then you get the old um, reply that, oh, well, you've got to live in the real world, mate. This is progress. And they say, oh, well, you know, events in the world uh, make it impossible for us to do anything else. You know, we've got to do this. We've got no choice. And that's a very good example of the way this new world order is being introduced by stealth. Because this global tyranny is not about tanks in the streets. It's what I've described as a coup d'etat on the human mind. The way it works and has worked for a long time, if we only started to realize it, is by engineering events and sending out messages through the media that get public opinion in any area that it's dealing with, whatever subject area it is, to get to that classic point where public opinion says about something, something must be done. And when we reach that point of something must be done, the people who have created the problem to get people to come to that state of mind, then step forward with the solution to the problem, which just happens to be what they were going to do all along, and it also takes us further along the road to centralized global control. In the words of a, its own secret document, create problems, then offer solutions. And it's happening all the time. To bring about the situation where a problem is highlighted, something must be done, here's the solution, off we go to the next stage on the road. In 1986, uh, someone bought an IBM copier at a second-hand sale. And when they got it home, they found inside a very thick document, which obviously shouldn't have been there, called Quiet Weapons, uh, or rather Silent Weapons for a Quiet War. And this described a policy of mass public mind control that has been orchestrated on the people of the world, particularly the Western world, since the 1950s. See if, I'll uh, just read you a little bit of it, see if you recognize the world this document is describing. Experience has proven that the simplest method of securing a silent weapon and gaining control of the public 
is to keep the public undisciplined and ignorant of basic systems principles on the one hand, while keeping them confused, disorganized, and distracted with matters of no real importance on the other hand. This is achieved by, one, disengaging their minds, sabotaging their mental activities, providing a low-quality program of education in mathematics, logic, systems design, and economics, and discouraging technical creativity. Two, engaging their emotions, increasing their self-indulgence and their indulgence in emotional and physical activities by A, unrelenting emotional affrontations and attacks, brackets, mental and emotional rape, by way of a constant barrage of sex, violence, and wars in the media, especially the TV and the newspapers. B, giving them what they desire, in excess, junk food for thought, and depriving them of what they really need. Three, rewriting history and law and subjecting public opinion to the deviant creation, which I take to mean don't tell them who they really are. Thus being able to shift their thinking from personal needs to highly fabricated outside priorities. These preclude their interest in and discovery of the silent weapons of social automation technology. The general rule, it says, is that there is profit in confusion. The more confusion, the more profit. Therefore, the best approach is to create problems and then offer solutions. Diversion summary. Media. Keep the adult public attention diverted away from real social issues and captivated by matters of no real importance. Does that describe our media today or what? Schools. Keep the young public ignorant of real mathematics, real economics, real law, and real history. Entertainment. Keep the public entertainment below a sixth grade level. Work. Keep the public busy, 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 with no time to think, back on the farm with the other animals. I'll give you another example of this. When legislation is being planned against, say, a target group of people, they don't just sit around a cabinet table and decide one day that's what we're going to do and then they set about doing it. It happens long before then. Public opinion has to be softened up against the target group of people. So what you see over a period of time is lots of um, uh, media coverage of this group of people and they are presented by events and, and what have you as, quote, a problem. And this has been done with the travellers, for instance. So after a period of time, public opinion gets to the point where it says, something must be done. And at that point, they come forward with the legislation which was waiting in the background all along. And you know how they find out if public opinion has reached the desired level to whack out the legislation? It's our old friend, the polling organisation. They're not there to test public opinion to see what people think so that governments can react to it. They are there for two reasons. First of all, to find out if the propaganda of various kinds on the public mind has worked or not, or whether it needs another batch. And secondly, to create a situation where public opinion in quotation marks, is highlighted in certain areas. Because we do have the... Unfortunately, and lots of people like to think that they think like everyone else. So if you suggest that 60% or 70% of the people think this, very soon 70% of the people will think that. And the people who go uh, along in the streets with the, uh, the, the, uh, the boards and ask the questions, they haven't got a clue what they're being used for. They're just doing their job, asking questions that are listed and so on. Because as I'll come to in a second, the vast majority of people who are playing a part in creating this global tyranny haven't got a clue what they're part of. Wouldn't work if they had. All this and the New World Order plan in general is being coordinated through this global network of secret societies, which I and many other researchers call the Brotherhood. And at the top of this pyramid of manipulation is a group, an elite, who really pull the strings, 
which uh, researchers know as the Illuminati, which is like Latin, as I understand it, for the illuminated ones. It's a name that goes back thousands of years. And if you think about it, everything, every structure in our world, uh, from a small business to a secret society, is based on a pyramid. A pyramid situation in which those at the top of the pyramid, say the top of a business, they know the whole agenda of that business exactly where it's going and what the whole game plan of that business is. The further you come down the levels, if you like, within that business, the less those people know about the big picture. They only know about their part in it. And this is how the secret societies work. On the lower levels of initiation, for instance, in the Freemasons, they haven't got a clue what the whole organization is being used for and uh, infiltrated to achieve by those at the higher level. They only know their part in it. I mean, organizations like the CIA and uh, other intelligence agencies, they work on something called compartmentalization, which is exactly the same. Those at the top of the agency know what the game plan is and what is uh, the direction that they wish to go. Those lower down in the agency only know their part in it. And many people within this uh, situation they genuinely believe that what they're doing is good for the world. But they don't know what they're doing uh, or how what they're doing fits in with what they're doing, fits in with what they're doing, and other people who also don't know the big game plan. And when you fit the bits together, then you see it's anything but positive. Like I say, if this was a conspiracy involving enormous numbers of people wouldn't work. Someone would spill the beans years ago. It's a very tiny number of people who know the real game plan. And everyone else in that pyramid is manipulated. So who are they, this they, this elite that we talk about? And how, people might rightly ask, can a conspiracy continue over at least many centuries because people die, don't they? I mean, it will all end, wouldn't it? If people, When people die, it would die with them. But of course as I'll come to in a sec, because of the way it's structured, it doesn't work like that. The they are people who are initiated into the highest levels of this great global network of secret societies. Because at the top of the network is this elite that turns, in effect, all those different, apparently different secret societies into one gigantic organization. And at that elite level are people who have been initiated into the real agenda. So during their lifetimes, they continue the string pulling to push the world further along the road to this global centralization known as the New World Order. But at the same time, they're looking down this pyramid of initiation levels for others who they consider of the right attitude and of the right ability to also be initiated into the real agenda. And when that happens, they get the knowledge, and then they take it on when the first people die. So in this way, while the they, in terms of personnel, people, names, change with the generations, the agenda they're working to goes on basically the same. They also tend to come from certain families, Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and many others in America, which helps this continuity through the generations. The key to this brotherhood manipulation is the control of money, or funny money, to be more accurate. What I call funny money is this staggeringly ludicrous situation in which you can deposit, say, a thousand pounds in a bank, and it can lend ten thousand pounds on the back of that. Money that doesn't actually exist, it's a conjuring trick. Indeed, um, some stuff that I've been looking at this week there are uh, banks in America who are into lending 
$26,000 for every $1,000 that's deposited. And all that conjured money is, is numbers on a computer screen. And in this way, governments of the world, like the United States and individuals, have over a period of time reached a situation where they are drowning, and the world is drowning, in a tidal wave of debt for money that doesn't really exist. And here's the ruse, here's the the trick for the banks. If you don't pay back the interest on money that doesn't actually exist and has been conjured out of nothing, then they can come and take wealth from you that does exist, like your house, your car, your property. And there's another little thing I was looking at the other day. When money is created for a loan in this way, say a loan of £20,000, the bank creates £20,000. But you're not paying back £20,000. You're paying back £20,000 plus all the interest. But the money created is only the capital, the £20,000. So over the period of paying back that loan, the interest has to come from wealth already in existence. And as the generations pass, more and more wealth, uh, as a result, is being sucked out of the pool of the world into the coffers of a very few massively wealthy, breathtakingly, words wouldn't describe it, wealthy Banks and bankers. The manipulation is uh, its almost funny if it wasn't so tragic. Um, back in uh, the time of the Battle of Waterloo, the guy who was in charge of the Rothschild Empire was a guy called Nathan Rothschild, who um, was an absolutely brilliant manipulator of the system. And there's one kind of story that sums it up, really. Um, When uh, the Battle of Waterloo was fought and the result was known, Wellington won, the moment uh, it was decided, Nathan Rothschild was off across land to the English Channel, crossed the Channel as quick as he could and ended up in the financial centre of London, dishevelled, panic-stricken, to announce that Napoleon had won the war. He then very publicly started selling off some of his stocks at ludicrously low prices. Panic! Everyone else starts selling off stocks at ludicrously low prices. Secretly, Nathan's buying them all up. And of course, in those days, we never had radio, television, So it took some days to get the result of the war back because Nathan was ahead of the game. When the result came that Wellington had won, panic over. Stocks go up, Nathan sells. And he made a colossal fortune out of that. And that is uh, a good example of how right up to to the modern world these things are manipulated. When we turn on the news and we hear about stock market crashes or, or uh, runs on the pound or whatever, they're not accidents. They're engineered. The people who make a fortune out of economic catastrophe are those who know economic catastrophe is coming. And they know it's coming because they caused it. I'll give you another uh, quick example of how this Uh, situation works. Back at the start of this century, uh, the Illuminati uh, wanted control of the American economy, which they very much have now. They wanted to create something called the Federal Reserve System, which which is, to this day, a cartel of private banks that lend money to the American government at interest, interest of which is paid by the taxpayers of America. So while people are homeless and hungry in America... Income tax is being spent on paying interest on money that doesn't exist to private banks. Great work if you can get it. 
And they kind of brought this about by, back in 1910, the bankers met at a place called Jekyll Island. And they wrote this Federal Reserve bill, exactly what, the, what they wanted to happen. But they had a little bit of a problem in the sense that by this time, the American people, particularly the farmers and such like, were up to here with the behavior of the banks who by now were controlling America. So what did the bankers do? When the bill which they had written was made public and proposed, the bankers who had written it vehemently, publicly opposed it. And so the people who were fed up with the behavior of the banks, they looked at that situation and they thought, well, crikey, if they're a it, we'll have it. And the Federal Reserve Bill was passed. It gave the banks and the Illuminati total control over the American economy and the public had been persuaded that it was a very good idea because it did the opposite. This is why we have to get wise to this manipulation because black is white and white is black and for the best of intentions, we can help this plan if we don't know what's going on and become wise to it. The other thing, uh, which is kind of relevant right to the present day really, the other thing they did in uh, that early part of that century at the time the Federal Reserve Bill was passed was they uh, wanted to introduce the Federal Income Tax Bill in America. Now, to do that, they had to get a uh, revision amendment to the American Constitution, the so-called 16th Amendment. Now, to do that, they needed 36 states to agree. They got two. Now, in a democracy that we're supposed to live in, um, it would have been thrown in the bin. States won't have it, can't pass it. But, of course, we're not in a democracy. All that happened was that the Secretary of State, a guy called Philander Knox, went to Congress and announced that it had all been agreed. And everyone just accepted it. And so federal income tax became law, although it wasn't law because it had never been passed. And in 1985, there was a businessman in America who'd sussed all this and he wouldn't pay his income tax. And they came and took his car. And when they took his car, or whatever it was, probably, I think it was his car, he took him to court. And he won. And Nexus magazine, which is a, a magazine uh, centered on Australia, but now available in this country and uh, more and more countries around the world, which is dedicated to exposing the, what's going on, they uh, published a copy of a letter from the head of the Inland Revenue Service in America. That's the equivalent of our um, Inland Revenue. It's called the uh, Internal Revenue Service in America. And the Internal Revenue Service is a private company which collects federal income tax in America. And the commissioner for the Internal Revenue in a, uh, a memo to all these district directors uh, dated April the 4th, 1985, says that this court case has taken place the fact that the legislation was never ratified, and he says the effect of this is such that every tax paid into the Treasury since 1913 is due and refundable to every citizen and business in the United States. I think they ought to pay it back, I reckon. But the interesting thing further on is advise each of your managers that they are not to discuss this situation with anyone there will be no written communications and you are to destroy this memorandum. So even though the powers that be are very well aware that to take people's property or to force them to pay income tax is illegal, the vast majority of people in America still think it's the law because no one's telling them. The more you kind of get into this, the more you kind of realize it's almost impossible to exaggerate the scale of the deception. As the Robots Rebellion uh, documents, the Illuminati over the centuries and into this one have used this manipulative power and knowledge to create booms and busts to suit their ambitions. They were behind the so-called people's revolutions in uh, France, uh, in Russia and elsewhere. It's been documented at how um, American bankers were paying Lenin and Trotsky through uh, bank accounts in Sweden so that the revolution would happen. 
They engineered and then funded both sides in the two world wars. They engineered the wars in Vietnam, the Gulf, and endless others. And they created the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union when at the Illuminati level, America and Soviet Union were the same side. Like I say, these, uh, these guys are not uh, stupid, far from it, but they are strange. Some of the uh, initiation ceremonies are, uh, are quite bizarre and kind of take you aback when you see some of the people that have been involved in them and the places of power that they then get into. For instance, in America, there's a, there's a secret society called the Skull and Bones Society, which is based on Harvard and Yale universities and uh, a very sinister organization. And President Bush is a member of this secret society, as are many people within the places of power throughout America. And uh, to be initiated into this secret society, you have to lie naked on your back in a coffin uh, while a a ribbon is tied in a strategic place and you shout out um, details of your sexual experiences. Now, there may be some people that think that might be a lot of fun, but the question is this, is that the mentality that should be President of the United States and head of the CIA? And more important than that, when people get involved in these secret societies, part of the initiation is to pledge your total loyalty to that society. So, for instance, when President Bush is uh, President of the United States, as he was, His first allegiance is not to the people who elected him, but to the secret society to which he's pledged his entire being. And when you look into the background, you see that that was certainly the case. Indeed, he would not have become president, and neither will anyone else, including President Clinton, unless the Illuminati wanted it, because they control, through money as much as anything, but also through the media, which they also control, who becomes Democratic and Republican presidential candidate. You can't become uh, a member of the, uh, the people who run for being presidential candidate within your own party in America unless you have vast sums of money behind you. To run for president, the figures enter dreamland. And if you don't suit those with the money, you don't run for president. Not in a way that you've got a chance of winning anyway. And if uh, you think that there are still some people in America who actually believe that the American people decide who the president will be, it's very quaint, but unfortunately it's no longer true. And should a president or prime minister become an obstacle to these brotherhood ambitions, then they're removed, either through assassination or far more often by creating events and activating the media to undermine the person involved so that they're either uh, thrown out by the electorate or, in the case of Margaret Thatcher, for instance, by their own side. It's interesting to note that in the history of America, there have been two presidents who have started the process of ending the situation where the government lends money from the private banks and pays interest on it, and replacing that situation with the government printing its own money interest-free. Two presidents have started the process of doing that. One was Abraham Lincoln, the other was John F. Kennedy. They also have something else in common, of course. I also make the the case in the Robots' Rebellion for Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King and John Lennon being murdered by the same force. Through this century, the Illuminati have created front organizations, so-called think tanks for the real agenda of what is going on. Most of the people, again, or many of them anyway, involved in these organizations have no idea what they're being used for. A guy called uh, (coughs) Cecil Rhodes, an Englishman, back in the latter part of the last century, had this ambition to create a one-world government based on Britain and to form a secret society 
to help to bring about that end. And the secret society became known as the Round Table. The Round Table is structured on classic secret society lines with people only allowed to know what they need to know and most people not knowing the real agenda. When he died in 1902, Rhodes bequeathed money to set up scholarships for overseas students to uh, come to Oxford University and to promote his one-world government beliefs and to have them indoctrinated into these one-world government beliefs. And the most famous recipient of this scholarship today is the Rhodes Scholar now occupying the White House, Bill Clinton. After Rhodes died, the round table was taken over by a guy called Alfred Milner, who was a banker and highly influential in the First World War, uh, Lloyd George's war cabinet, and by those who controlled the Rockefeller and Rothschild empires. In the 1920s, this network of think tanks were added to uh, or created with um, the creation of the Institute of International Affairs in London, now known as the Royal Institute, with the Queen as its patron, also known as Chatham House. In America... Another group was set up called the Council on Foreign Relations, set up with Rockefeller money. In 1972 came yet another of these front organizations working in concert with each other called the Trilateral Commission, set up by, by the Rockefellers with a guy called Zbigniew Brzezinski as its head. It became public in 1973. The immediate ambition of this trilateral commission, incidentally, was to put a trilateral commission member into the White House as President of the United States as quick as possible. They managed it in three years when Jimmy Carter became a member. And he filled that administration with trilateralist members. His natural, national security advisor was our old friend Zbigniew Brzezinski, who actually started up the trilateral commission. The Vice President, Walter Mondale, the Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, and all the major players, or most of them anyway, in that Carter administration were Trilateral Commission members, an organization that had only been going for three years. Members of these front organizations, the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations, are in all areas of American politics, banking, biz business, the media, and any other area that requires manipulation. The United Nations is another front organization for this centralized one world government. The actual building is actually built in New York, the United Nations building, on land given free by the Rockefellers and the structure of the United Nations was written during the last war by a committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. And the UN is being used now as a vehicle to introduce a world army under central control. Conflicts are being created around the world to get public opinion globally to say about uh, the United Nations' ability to respond to these conflicts which are being engineered. Something must be done. And the solution that will be offered is, well, what we need is a permanent army so that we can react immediately. You know when, when uh, you've got things like Rwanda and people say, where's the UN? Why do they react so late? They don't react so late by accident. They react so late on purpose to create the situation where we say the UN has got to be more effective. And they say, well, if we're going to be more effective and, and, and react to these things, then what we've got to have is a permanent army. And that is now in the process of being created. Create the problems, offer the solutions. These front organizations, uh, or these front groups, are organizations within organizations because the members go off and become part of the government, become part of the military, the security services, the education system, the media, the economic system, and they work to their own agenda within these organizations. All are in infiltrated with this new world order philosophy by members of these brotherhood fronts. And if you want to know what the future foreign policy, and this can be proved to be true if you read the back numbers, if you want to know what the uh, future foreign policy of the United States will be, you just have to read a magazine called Foreign Affairs, the magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations. Because what it writes today, the American government will do tomorrow. We have a democracy in the United States and in Britain and in other so-called free countries. You must be joking. In 1990, there was an Illuminati coup d'etat in Britain and no one realized it. Another major element of this network of 
front organizations and secret government of the world, which is what it effectively is, is something called the Bilderberg Group. It's called the Bilderberg Group because it first met publicly in 1954 in a hotel called the Bilderberg in Holland, the Netherlands, under the chairmanship for a long time of Prince Bernhard of the House of Orange, who was a member of the German SS and later became chairman of Shell Oil. The Bilderberg Group is run by the Rockefellers, the Rothschild Empires, among others. And it brings together, once a year, and it never meets in the same place twice, all the people who can help with the manipulation in all these areas that I'm talking about. Media, politics, and I'm, in politics, I'm not talking about Fred Jones, MP for Margate or whatever. I'm talking about prime ministerial level. The Director General of NATO is or, always there. And they meet, as I say, once a year, never meet in the same place twice, to decide what the future is going to be for the following year on the, world, on the road to the new world order. The Bilderberg Group is designed like all the others. It's a series of circles with a central core elite. The steering committee or the permanent staff of the Bilderberg Group, they know the agenda. And they're working constantly full-time towards it. Then there is another circle outside of that, which are the regular attenders of the Bilderberg Group meetings. These are people from the media and all the areas that I'm talking about who also know the agenda, but they work towards it not within the Bilderberg Group full-time, but in their own area of influence, wherever it may be. And then there is another circle who are politicians and people from other areas of influence who don't know the full agenda or even sometimes any agenda but are invited to maybe one meeting, maybe a couple, to be fed the party line that centralized world government, etc., etc., is a good idea. So remember the Illuminati and the Bilderberg Group and this network I'm talking about want a world government, world central bank, world currency and world army. And the penultimate stage towards that is the creation of trading blocks around the world European community, the North American free trade area, and one based down with Japan and Australia. And from this uh, situation where you have the three trading blocks that are now becoming centralized politically and centralized in terms of currency, or that's the way that we're being pushed, they then will go global. And it's interesting, I came across only this week a quote in a book written in 1942 by Joseph Stalin, that great liberal from the Soviet Union. And in his book, he says this, 1942, divide the world into regional groups as a transitional stage to world government. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague na uh, regional loyalty than they will for a world authority. Later, the regional can be brought um, all the way to a super world government. And that, in a paragraph, is precisely what these trading blocks around the world are being created to do. Now, anyone who gets seriously in the way of that aim of a United States of Europe has to be undermined and removed in some way. And in May 1989, an uh, investigative newspaper in America called Spotlight that had investigated this for a long time reported that it had managed to establish that at the Bilderberg Group meeting on La Toja Island of Spain in that same month, May 1989, it was decided that Margaret Thatcher would be removed as Prime Minister of Britain because of, quote, her refusal to yield British sovereignty to the European superstate that is to emerge after 1992. And of course, in 1990, a year after that Bilderberg Group meeting, Margaret Thatcher was removed while in office. Now, Personally, I couldn't be more opposed to the policies of Margaret Thatcher, but if she's going to be removed, it should be by the people of this country and not by some secret unelected government. And of course, what happens in that situation is that people lower down the initiation level, the gophers, um, get the order that she's got to go. And when we talk here about uh, the Conservative Party leader in this country uh, changing, or whether he's going to stay or she's going to stay, along comes this phrase, it will be decided by the men in grey suits. Well, the men in grey suits are largely just 
the Illuminati gophers. Now what happens is the, these um, men in grey suits don't go around the tea rooms of the House of Commons saying to Conservative MPs, the Bilderberg groups decided she's got to go, you know, and they say, all right, and we'll vote for that. They go around and they do it in a much more subtle fashion. They'll get someone who's got a small majority, for instance, and they'll say, you know, if she stays, you've got no chance, mate. And they'll say to ministers, you know, you've, you, you better enjoy it while you can because you're not going to be a minister after the next election. And then they get the media, which they also control, to start undermining the target figure through stories in the papers and what have you. And in the end, a momentum is built up that is unstoppable. And in the end, that person goes in whatever form it may be. In terms of Margaret Thatcher, she was voted out by her own side. Finding out what's going on within these Bilderberg group meetings is very difficult for obvious reasons. But Lord Carrington, the former British cabinet minister and secretary general of NATO, became its chairman in 1991, and he's also a president of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, another part of his network. And a name that keeps coming up again and again, no matter who you talk to and what the researcher is, and almost what subject area they're researching, is Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State in America. He's got a full house. He's a member of the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations. Never gets home, you know. He must be at a meeting every hour of every day. Other people known to have attended the 1991 Bilderberg Group meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany, was Bill Clinton, then the governor of Arkansas, the Rhodes Scholar, who then became president very soon afterwards of the United States. The Secretary General of NATO was there in 1991 when Spotlight uh, had a very good year of uncovering who was there. So were the high and mighty of politics, banking, the Rockefellers, representatives of the big global companies, the military, the media, and people like the owner of the Washington Post, Catherine Graham, who also has a full set. She's a member of all these different front organizations, very cozy little club. And it's interesting that you don't read reports of these Bilderberg group meetings in the Times, the Sunday Times, the Sun, today. Funny, really, because one of the people at that 1991 Bilderberg group meeting and very much involved in the organization was, according to Spotlight, a man called Andrew Knight, the then chairman of Rupert Murdoch's News International, which owns all those papers. You don't read about Bilderberg uh, meetings in the Daily Telegraph either. And yet its owner, Conrad Black, was also at that meeting and has been at many others. And who just happens to be on the board of the Hollinger Corporation of Conrad Black that owns the Daily Telegraph and goodness knows how many other outlets, media outlets around the world? Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington. Same names keep coming up all around the place, time and time again. See, journalists are not there to inform the public. They're there to direct opinion in the desired direction. They are manipulated to manipulate everyone else. Very few are real journalists. They are little more than copy typists for the manipulators, turning round news of engineered events to push the public on. And most of them don't know they're doing it. Some of the uh, more intelligent ones know they're doing it but can't see a way out of the structure they're stuck with. There's a guy called John Swainton, a long-time editor of the New York Times, who worked in this situation for a long, long time. And then when it came to his retirement dinner, he spoke to his staff in terms that spoke the truth that he'd been holding within himself to preserve his job up to that point. And what he said to his staff was this, there is no such thing as a free press. You know it and I know it. There's not one of you who would dare to write his honest opinions. The business of a journalist is to destroy truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon, and to sell himself, his country, and his race for his daily bread. This is the important bit. We are tools, vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are jumping jacks. They pull the strings, we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are the property of these men. We are intellectual prostitutes. So we have a structure of manipulation which is string-pulling the politicians of all political colors 
the media, the intelligence agencies, the big companies and the global banking system. And the plan now is to create so much conflict around the world, so much chaos, including a massive global collapse which they'll engineer someone else to be blamed for, that we'll have a situation where we'll have a massive problem which has to find a solution. And the solution will be centralized government, centralized bank, centralized currency, which won't be physical money, but which will be credit, and centralized army. One group of people which this conspiracy must suppress if it's to succeed in the next generation is the young. And there is today a war on the young and anyone remotely different from the programmed off the peg norm. The Illuminati agents, bizarre as it may seem, and I can understand that it does at first sight, the Illuminati agents within British intelligence and the CIA and other major global security services control the world market in illegal drugs through other uh, aspects of the Brotherhood network like the Mafia. They do this for three main reasons. First of all, to make enormous amounts of money which they can then channel into their own secret projects without having to divert it from government channels which could be traced, not least because a lot of the covert operations in, that secret society, um, security services are involved with are against their own government. It's interesting that uh, I've read a, a lot of uh, evidence and a lot of uh, suggestions from various researchers that the BCCI bank, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which crashed, of course, amid a, a quote, scandal, was actually being used as a front by intelligence agencies to launder drug money and to also launder um, illegal arms sales money. And it's interesting also how you can be duped if you don't know the background to what's going on because when uh, the scandal of the BCCI broke, the American government... Uh, appointed a guy called Senator John Kerry of Massachusetts to head the investigation into this scandal. And he made all the right noises. He stood up and said, you know, this is a scandal and we must get to the bottom of this and I'll do everything I can, no stone unturned, you know the stuff. Well, he never got to the bottom of it. His investigation came up with basically nothing. Now, you may think on the face of it, well, he just didn't, wasn't very successful. And then you realize that he's also a member of the Skull and Bones secret society that other members of the government are also involved with. Maybe, maybe he shared a coffin with George Bush, you never know. The second reason for expanding the use of drugs is that in the name of a war on drugs, you can persuade the public to hand over powers of arrest and search and... Um, raids on homes that they'd never accept unless there was a problem that had to find a solution. Create problems and then offer solutions. For instance, if you want to have a more authoritarian police force or an armed police force that hasn't been armed before and you want to do it not only without the public challenging you but with the public demanding that you do it, what do you need? You need more high-profile, very public, violent crime. Something must be done. Armed police force, more authoritarian laws. Thank you very much. Duped again. The third reason for the CIA's involved and others' involvement in drugs is that they know that a drugged-up, screwed-up young generation is so much easier to manipulate than one which is aware of its infinite potential for love, creativity, and contribution to a positive change in the world. The ease with which young people can have access to drugs today is absolutely ludicrous, and it's ludicrous because it's meant to be ludicrously easy. 
It's been shown that British intelligence and the CIA were experimenting with LSD long before it was unleashed on the young in the 60s. And if people think it's far-fetched, then you just got to look at what the British did through the East India Company to the Chinese. When they wanted to exploit and control the Chinese, what did they do? They tried to get them hooked on opium. Same principle. They want to break the spirit of the young in every way they can to stop them thinking, expressing their individuality, and realizing their true and infinite potential. mentioned earlier that one other aspect of this New World Order conspiracy is the desire for a microchipped population. A population that would be effectively linked to a computer. Now, this is kind of takes two forms. First of all, there is the, the money side. You know, we're talking now about having credit cards and identity cards and everything like that. And the, the push is all to getting rid of physical money and having credit cards and credit alone as the form of currency. Now that's great, you would think, some would think. And what uh, the next stage after the credit card is, is the barcode on the person. The guy at IBM, I understand, that inve invented the barcoding for tins of beans in the supermarket has also invented one that goes under the, just under the skin. So instead of going in the garage or the shop and using a credit card across the thing like that, you would be linked to a computer via this barcoding. The problem is, if the computer says, no siree, you don't have an alternative of saying, oh, okay, then I'll pay with cash, because that's not going to exist in the longer term, which is very much part of this plan. So suddenly we're under the control at that point of a computer deciding whether we are going to have the things that we need or not. And there's another aspect of this uh, microchip uh, ambition that the Illuminati have, and that is the microchip that can tell them exactly where we are at whatever time we are. And again, on the face of it, it sounds like fantasy land, all that stuff. And I wrote in the Robots Rebellion about this, and someone uh, read the manuscript and said, oh, that's far-fetched, because what I was saying was there is a plan to bounce public opinion into accepting babies being microchipped at birth in the same process their way to be microchipped. Because, I mean, you're talking about that long just to put one under the skin. And it does sound far-fetched, I can understand that, but the kind of evidence I saw was compelling enough to be put, for me to put it in. Just after the book came out, I picked up a magazine and an article by a guy called Dr. Carl Sanders, who is a highly acclaimed electronics engineer in America. And he was developing a microchip to help spinal injury patients put inside and help the messages go down the spinal cord, presumably. And he said in this article that at some point, this project was taken over by what he described as the One World Brigade. And he said he attended about 17 meetings, some in America, some in Europe, which were discussing how this microchip could be turned into a form of identification linked to a computer. And guess who attended the meetings? Old Henry again. Gets everywhere, Henry. And I said in the Robots Rebellion that I felt that what um, they would attempt to do to bounce public opinion, problem solution, was to highlight missing children stories and therefore get something must be done. Actually, we've got the technology now, you know. You've only got a microchip, put a little microchip, they won't know it's there, and then we'll know exactly where they are. And so we'll never, miss you, never lose your child again. Oh, great, we'll have some of that. And there I sat reading this article from this guy, Carl Sanders, and what does he say in it? He said that in these meetings it was discussed how to get pu the public to accept them. And what did they say they were going to propose to do? To make the public aware of missing children. 
And one of the things they did in America, and are possibly still doing, I don't know, was to get one of the dairy multinationals that is linked to this whole, or elements within which are linked to this whole business, and they put missing children on all their milk cartons. So all the time, subconsciously or consciously, we're being hit at breakfast in America with missing children, missing children, missing children. Problem, problem, problem. Something must be done. And of course, um, what's happening uh, in America now in terms of animals, all this is accepted. You'll never lose Rover if he's microchipped. Well, we'll have have some of that. Dogs and animals in America are increasingly microchipped and linked to a computer. In fact, I saw a story on a local news bulletin down the south um, recently, south of England, which said that it was being done to horses and stuff like that. But this is not technology that somewhere in science fiction future, it exists now. The question is, how is the public mind going to be manipulated into accepting it? So what I've set out so far tonight, at the very least, surely needs and deserves to be seriously addressed and investigated. And we need to get streetwise to what's going on. And you would think, given the massive amount of documented evidence there is just outside the public arena, that those parties and groups who use the term for themselves radicals would be shouting this stuff from the rooftops, organizing protests galore, but largely they're nowhere to be seen. And I've been stunned at how many people who believe themselves to be radicals to have sussed the system are being duped like everyone else, more so in many cases. Far from exposing this conspiracy that is moving on to endanger the future of our children, those who are, con- um, are trying to do that are being condemned by some of them. See, this is an important point because to the Brotherhood game plan, the robot radicals are just as important as the robot right. The idea, and it's worked magnificently, was to create right across society phony wars. Wars between right and between left between Labour and Conservative, between Republicans and Democrats, between bosses and workers. And all the time, there we are fighting each other. Oh, it's the Tories. No, it's the Socialists. No, it's the bosses. No, it's the unions. And over here are the manipulators going, thank you very much, I'll have some of that. Divide and rule is the bottom line. And so these phony wars are dividing and ruling. And we never look behind us and see who's pulling the strings of everybody. What the uh, manipulators do is play one black and white rigid dogmatic belief system against another rigid dogmatic belief system and create conflict as a result. That's what largely the Cold War was about. What the Cold War was about was creating this black and white belief system against another black and white belief system on a global scale. Divide and rule. So war was replaced in terms of control by fear of war. Same thing. The only fundamental difference between black and white right and black and white left are the words used to describe their particularly particular black and white belief system. Because unless we leave the black and white alone and start looking at the shades of grey where the truth always lies, then we'll go on being duped and we'll deserve to be so. And yet, while, since the Robots Rebellion came out a few, couple of months ago, while so many people who are, wouldn't describe themselves as radicals, have kind of opened their minds to all this and started to to say, hey, what are we going to do about it? So many who are considered to be radicals have done nothing but have a go. Apparently, I read in one newspaper, um, I am anti-Semitic. I wouldn't know how to be racist if I took a correspondence course. The whole idea is ludicrous that we can judge anyone by their physical body for all the reasons I've talked about tonight. Bizarre. 
This charge from the political equivalent of disgusted Tunbridge Wells comes from quoting extracts from the so-called Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the Robots' Rebellion. It matters not to a robot radical that in the book I say that to blame the protocols on Jewish people is quite wrong. And that no one has suffered more in this century than some Jewish people from the very manipulation I'm exposing or seeking to expose tonight and in the book. It matters not to the robot radical that I actually renamed the protocols, the Illuminati protocols, to get away from the fact that they're blamed on the Jewish people. It matters not because there are no shades of grey in the manipulated mind of the robot radical just as there are no shades of grey in the manipulated mind of the robot right. These protocols that came to light in the 1800s tell the story of the manipulation of the 20th century, the very manipulation that is being documented all over the world today. They outline the game plan of the 20th century in the most extraordinary way in documents that were written before the 20th century had even begun. And if we are not adult enough to divorce the two issues of what the protocols contain and who has been quite wrongly blamed for them, then we are going to be a manipulator's dream because it's the subtle shades of grey where we'll find the reality of what's going on. And even then it's not easy. We are at the time in human evolution when we need to grow up spiritually and awaken to our true and infinite potential for love, for creativity and forgiveness of all that has gone before in this tapestry of pain and pleasure that we call life on earth. I've talked for many years, sometimes to the sound of laughter, though increasingly less so, that we are in a period of enormous change. That over the period between now and maybe 2020, 2030, we will see change that from the perspective of today will beggar belief. The more I've kind of investigated it, the more I've read other people's opinions and other people's research, the more I've, in my own mind anyway, come to appreciate the nature of this change which you can take or leave because it's only a, a view. I've kind of read stuff and talked to people about a, an explanation that feels compellingly good to me. And that is that there is a great circle of energy within this galaxy which is centered on a cluster of stars known as the Pleiades. And this ring of energy is a bit like, if you think about the rings of Saturn, similar to that, only it's not physical. It is highly charged, massively powerful energy. And goes way out from that cluster of stars. Because everything in creation, and certainly everything in this solar system and beyond is in orbit. Like if, if you look at the inside of an atom, it's a series of things in orbit. You take on to the next stage, you've got a planet going round in orbit round the sun. The solar system is in orbit. Everything is in orbit, moving around a central point. And it's been worked out by a number of people I think there's been a whole book now produced about it, that this solar system passes through these, this ring of highly charged energy once every 10 to 12,000 years. goes through one side, through the centre, through the other side, round and 12,000 years later or whatever, the process goes on and on. Which is kind of interesting because it's uh, projected that we are now entering this process of going through this highly charged energy again. And if you go back 10, 12,000 years, the last time we would have gone through this process on the explanation that I'm putting forward would have been the time of the end of this 
so-called mythical, but I believe very real civilization known as Atlantis. When an energy field, be it a planet or whatever, goes through this beam of highly charged energy, and it's been estimated, again, it takes about 2,000 years to go right the way through it, that energy field is massively energized and rebalanced. So, if an energy field is massively out of balance, this process is going to move it in vibratory terms very quickly, a very long distance, which kind of means all hell's going to break loose because everything is energy. The weather's energy. Geological events are energy, etc., etc. We are energy. Everything's energy. Everything's thought. So the more out of balance a energy field is, the more severe the implications of this rebalancing process that happens as a natural sequence every 10 to 12,000 years. So whether this process of change, and when you look at the ancient writings um, and so many common themes through the generations, be it the Native American Indians, be it the Nostradamus thing, be it way back into ancient times, the Maya in Central America and the early part of this millennium, they're all pointing to a period of great change in the period that we are going into. Now, people may dismiss that, but I'm looking all the time for common themes, and I'm seeing through the two to 3,000 letters that I receive every year, people tell me their life stories and what's happening to them, I am seeing people of all different walks of life suddenly going through great change at this time of thinking, of perception, of everything. Something is changing that is very different to what we've been used to. So the more we can balance this energy field called Earth with harmony, with love, as opposed to all the other stuff we see around the world, the less painful will be this great change that we're heading into. This uh, Illuminati game plan that I'm talking about cannot succeed because this process of going through this rebalancing process will bring it to an end. On the other side of it, whatever happens is going to be a very different world and a very much better world. The reason it's very important to highlight what's going on and to do something about it is because a lot of people, a lot of genuine people, are going to be led up the garden path to do things that they really ought to be, not be doing because they don't know what the game plan is. And also, the whole basis of the manipulation is to divide us and is to get us to judge each other, to hate each other, to envy each other, to compete with each other, and therefore create the very opposite thought patterns, energies, that are necessary at this time. The way I kind of see the process of what's happening to so many people in the world now is that when, we, when the consciousness becomes incarnate in a physical body, not all of the consciousness is subject to the great limitations of the body, only that which I'll call the conscious level. What has become known as the subconscious and higher conscious levels of us are not subject to the great limitations of the physical body and therefore they have a much wider picture. In simple terms, if you saw the conscious level working through the physical body as the spaceman on the moon in the spacesuit and the subconscious and higher as mission control, you see the symbolic difference between the two. One is experiencing and subject to this, the pressures of this level, the other one has the wider picture. What kind of happens in this very imbalanced world that we're born into is that the two get divorced from each other. Imagine a uh, spaceman on the moon in the big space suit. He's got information coming in through the eyes and the ears that tell him about what's going on immediately around him. That's one source of information and perception. But he's also getting mission control that has the wider picture speaking to him. And so he's got two sources of information, the wider picture of the mission and the localized here and now around him information. Now that's great, that's a great balance and therefore he's got a perception of the whole picture. 
What would happen, however, if someone came along and snipped or dramatically reduced the power of his link with mission control? Suddenly, there he is, stuck in this very uh, limiting spacesuit, and the only information that he is receiving in which to perceive and behave and decide is suddenly coming in through the eyes and the ears. It wouldn't be long after that point was reached when his behavior and perception would be dramatically different to what it would have been had mission control been part of his um, information source. And my feeling is, and the feeling of many other people, is that the pressures of this world de-link us from higher levels of ourselves, and so we become dominated by this information above all else. And who's got control of this information? Our old friends that control the media, the education system, etc., etc. What I feel is happening, and it, crikey, is it, is, it, is it obvious in the letters that I receive every day, is this process of change that's going on as we begin to go into this rebalancing beam of energy is that this process of resynchronization among those who are open to it is creating the reconnection to oneness, as it's called. All levels of being are entering the perception process. And suddenly, and my goodness, it happened to me in a big way a few years ago, I was going around for a while saying, excuse me, what planet is this? And I get so many letters from people, um, increasing numbers as the weeks pass, who say, some of them from business people, who say, how come that all my life I've thought this system and that everything was the way to do it and you know, I've been dominated by growth graphs and shareholders' profits and then suddenly I can see it as the sham it is. What's happened? Why haven't I seen it before? Very constant thing that I get in letters. The answer is, before dominated, after resynchronization with other levels of self. Therefore, perception changes, understanding becomes wider. This process is happening among increasingly large numbers of people. It's not made the national news yet because it has to be in letters 10 feet high with knobs on before the national news pick it up. But it's growing and growing and growing outside the public arena all the time and there'll be many people in this audience who will have gone through it or are going through this process of reawakening and reevaluating our lives and our place in the world. And this resynchronization and this realization of the questions that need to be asked creates a freedom. It certainly has within me. I couldn't recommend it more. It's a freedom from caring less what people think about you, do about you, as long as you can justify what you're doing to yourself. It's a freedom that to echo Martin Luther King allows you to say that we are free at last, free at last. We've found the ultimate freedom. The freedom to think for ourselves and to live what we believe is right and not have someone else impose their belief system upon us. It's a freedom that allows you to ignore the ridicule and condemnation and go beyond what is scientifically and politically acceptable, even if people in the short term find it funny. For goodness sake, it's what's politically and scientifically acceptable that is destroying the world. This freedom from thought control and behavior control through fear allows you to set agendas and not wait for agendas to become acceptable. Truth does not become truth only when it becomes acceptable. This world did not become round only at the point where it became acceptable to say it was round. It was always round, even back in the days when you were a loony if you said it was anything but flat. This is a time when we're coming together, both within ourselves and within the world coming together to remember who we are, why we're here. A time above all to spread peace and love across the planet in our own lives and out to everyone else. And I don't mean love in the sense that we've come to accept it on earth, uh, which is uh, about I love you if what you do is acceptable to me. 
It's a love without condition, a love that doesn't seek to possess but seeks to set free. It's the kind of love we have for our children. We don't always like what they do or say. We may quite rightly say so, but we love them just the same. And when I kind of uh, try to expose what's going on in the world, as so many other people are doing, I don't seek to expose the behavior of the manipulators to condemn them as people. They're victims too, controlled by some highly imbalanced consciousness that's working through them. We need to meet this manipulation with unwaverable determination. Yes, but not with hatred and aggression to them as people, which just creates twice the hatred and twice the aggression, which is what we're trying to remove from the world. They may think they're in control, but they're not. They're just vehicles of a a battle being played out on the levels of consciousness that's just reflecting itself in this physical world. We all have a big decision to make in the world today. Are we going to make a stand against this manipulation and dedicate the rest of this physical life, and it's only one of an infinite number we choose to have, to speed the emergence of love and freedom in this world, or are we going to shrug our shoulders, have a good laugh, order another beer, switch over the TV channel, and allow ourselves to become another official microchip implanted robot? If we sit down or look the other way, that's what we're voting for, and more important, that's what we're condemning our children to also. As Edmund Burke said, all it takes for evil for triumph is for good people to do nothing. We are the generations today that are in a point of decision that can allow us to leave our children in nightmare or be the first generations for goodness knows how long to leave our children a better world than the one we found. We need to open our hearts and our eyes. Through our hearts we can take the spiritual path projecting love and harmony in the world But through our eyes, we need to be streetwise also to events unfolding uh, around us. If we fuse the streetwise and the spiritual, then it will become an unstoppable tidal wave of change. A change that will reveal the truth about humanity, that we are not evil, we are not stupid, but we can appear to be both sometimes if we fall for the manipulation. And that's a very good uh, point a positive point that comes out of all this. I keep hearing what I've tried to say, we need a better world, we need this, we need the other. We get this thing, you've probably had it too, you'll never get past human nature, mate. That's the problem, not worth it. But hold on a minute. It's documented very, uh, in very detailed terms how the two world wars in this century were engineered and manipulated into existence. And these other major wars in the world. That wasn't human nature. That was engineered, manipulated human nature. Human nature in its true form is very different to the one we are supposed to accept is the case. This assault on human freedom such as the criminal justice bill in this country, is not only curbing freedom of those that it uh, appears to be aimed at, people like the homeless and the travellers, it's part of a sequence to suppress all peaceful protest. 